of stuff, that all these four elements that really have to be present in a relationship that changes people's hearts. And again, it's the Lord who does this. Only the Holy Spirit can change hearts. But when we live our lives, when we love, know, speak, do, like Jesus showed us in his life on the earth, and like God models for, for us throughout his entire word, when we love, know, speak, do, like God, we, we do his work in his way. And you all might have heard the famous quote from Hudson Taylor, who was one of the first American missionaries to China. That um, when he was, he was talking about, he, he had a very strong conviction that he should never explicitly ask people to give money to his missionary work. Um, he really just had a firm conviction. The Bible doesn't necessarily teach us, but he had a firm conviction that um, he would never explicitly solicit people for money to, to pay, for, uh, pay a salary for him and his family to be in China. Um, and one of his very famous lines was, the, Lord, the Lord's work done in the Lord's way will never fail. And, and he applied that to his own life to say that I, I don't think the Lord will let me run out of money. I, I shouldn't have to ask. I don't think I agree with him on that count. But when we see how the Lord loves, knows, speaks, and does, that, that changes us. and It helps us recognize that even if I don't see the change I want to see in other people's lives, even if I don't see the change in my own life, that I want to see, at least not on my time frame, we can be confident that this is how the Lord is changing us. And that, in that process of sanctification, remember those very badly drawn double doors, the justification and adoption, when we go through those doors by faith in Jesus, we enter into this gym and the Lord is working us out. He's training us, not only so that we would be more like Jesus, as if that were some small thing, but that in becoming more like Jesus, we could be really useful and helpful in his purposes. Um, maybe you remember Second Timothy. Uh, this is one of my, my favorite passages where um, Paul is telling this young man that he's known and loved and invested in for years that the Lord is the master of a house. And, and in, in your household, the, the master has some things, some vessels that are for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Some of us get to be the candelabra, some of us get to be the chamber pot. <laughs> and it's enough that we're in the Lord's house and he can do with us whatever he wants. But there is a sense where Paul is, impl- is kind of impressing upon Timothy, be someone who so presses into knowing the Lord, so dedicates your life to knowing him, that you are fit for honorable use. Um, that really matters. Um, and I, we're going to ca- ca- cover some ground here as to what does it look like for us, before we ever even ask questions to know people better or speak or do, what does it mean for us to be people whose hearts are formed by love? Um, I'm going to read a story from the book because this is the kind of thing that we will experience many times in our lives, a real life, I'll call it a ministry opportunity, but really it's meeting a new person. Um, let me read this story, and, and as, as I'm reading it, think to yourself, do you, have you ever found yourself in a situation like this? She folded up her white cane and I led her to my office. She was not only blind, but lame in one leg. I had worked at a school for the blind during seminary and thought it was amazing that God had brought her my way. I was familiar with the lifestyle and struggles of the blind but I was not prepared for her story. She was an only child. Her mother had tried for 15 years to get pregnant, only to endure a string of miscarriages. Finally, at 40, she got pregnant and didn't miscarry. Her mother felt blessed as if her life were finally about to begin, and she chose a beautiful name, Grace, and waited in anxious expectation. Early one morning, after 20 hours of tortuous labor, Grace was born. But her her mother's dream was not to be realized. Grace was fretful, sickly, demanding. There seemed to be few moments when she wasn't crying. She had problems with her breathing and digestion. She seemed to contract every childhood illness. She didn't sleep through the night for her entire infancy. Her mother was seldom able to take her out of the house. Grace's mother thought she was the victim of a cruel fate. After all the years of waiting, she was left with a child who could barely live. Increasingly, the demands, cries, and constant work made her angry. She wondered why she'd ever wanted a child. She remembered how easy life had been before. In subtle ways at first, her anger began to spill over toward grace. A yank here, a little slap there. But the irritation eventually grew into full-blown rage. When she looked at her little girl, she saw someone who had robbed her of her life. Grace began to listen for her mother's footsteps so she could hide under the bed or in the closet. Her mother would then have to search for her, making her even angrier. In one of those angry encounters, Grace's leg was permanently injured. By the time Grace was eight years old, 
her eyes had begun to fail as a result of repeated blows to her head. She could no longer see to read, yet she was afraid to let anyone know how bad her eyesight actually was. She thought she was fooling everyone, but she wasn't. Just after her ninth birthday, Grace went to school for what she thought was a normal day. She was asked to leave her classroom and go to the office, where a lady she didn't know stood with a suitcase full of Grace's clothes. Without saying goodbye to her mother or her friends, she was transferred to a residential school for the blind where she would remain until she graduated from high school. Grace never lived at home again. She now sat before me, telling her story with angry tears. Grace was still alone. In her fearful, judgmental anger, she had trashed every relationship she'd ever had. Yet, she was deeply persuaded that people were abusing her as her mother once did. Her willingness to talk to me was itself an act of angry desperation. During her time in the School for the Blind, Grace had taken a religion class where she met a wonderful teacher who shared the gospel with her. She had sought me out because she wanted to talk to a Christian. She was convinced it was the only way she would hear the truth. At the same time, she didn't want anyone to feed her a bunch of biblical platitudes. I listened to her in tears, praying as she talked, quite aware that I was called to incarnate the Lord in this suffering woman's life. What would you say to Grace? What do you think she needs to hear? What does the Bible say to the graces of the world? How would you like Grace to look at her own past, her present, and her future? How would you build a relationship with her in which God's kingdom work would thrive? I don't know if you have anyone in your, in your life like that. Some of us may, may only meet one or two people like that. Some of us, it, it almost seems like we're a magnet to broken people, and they, and they come to us. And in either situation, experience doesn't necessarily make you wiser. <laughs> it makes you more experienced. But the, the, the broken people in our lives and, and the people whose brokenness then leads to sin, because grace is not without fault in the, in, the, in the bad way she's responded to bad and hard, awful situations in her life, how do we help those people? How do we help them change through the power of the gospel? Let me, in, to ask that question maybe a different way, is change simply a matter of confronting people with the truth and calling them to obey? Kind of a trick question. Because the answer is, yeah, but so much more. Grace needs the truth. And, and like all of us, grace needs to learn what it means to, to repent, to change in light of who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. But God also uses us in other ways, doesn't he? Not just to, even if said with a kind voice, to just lob Bible verses at people and, and throw the truth in their faces. Maybe you can think in your own way, let's, let's reverse the story so we're not just thinking about the graces in our lives. Let's think about ourselves. Think to yourself, how have you been changed in your life based on other people who have meant a lot to you? Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was somebody at church, maybe it was a friend or a coworker or a military buddy. Maybe there's somebody in your life who's changed the course of your life. We would say, God used that person to change my heart. And I'm sure maybe some of us can even think, I remember conversations. I remember specific things that someone said or preached or shared. And humanly speaking, those words changed my life. No doubt about it, right? But what other aspects of that relationship were really meaningful, what were really important to you? How did God work through, for lack of a better term, the, the, the nonverbal, the, the stuff that wasn't spoken? What, what, what kind of stuff like that did God use and work through? I think we could, we could all point to the people in our lives who have done the most good for us in Christ and say it was, it was their words, but it was more than just their words. Let's we'll switch it back to we're talking about ourselves, be, being those people and, and becoming more like Christ. If we're taking our role that God has given us as ambassadors seriously, we've, we've got to say that God changes people, not just through what we say, but through who we are and through what we do. It all works together. Sometimes you can't even separate it neatly out. Like, well, yeah, like some of it was, you know, th one third of it was what she said and one third of it was what she did and one third of it was just who she was and we can't separate it out like that. During, but during his ministry on earth, you remember Jesus said, and this is paraphrasing John 14 from the Last Supper, where he tells his doubting, fearful disciples who were really confused because he was preparing them for his own death, but they didn't quite connect the dots yet. 
in as many words, you remember John 14, 11, where essentially Jesus says, um, if, you've, if you have trouble believing what I say, then, then look at the things that I've done. That, that's, that's all the evidence you really need. If we're going to be ambassadors who are faithful to the Lord's call, we're not just called to speak the truth, but I'm going to use this word with an asterisk next to it. We speak the truth, but we also incarnate the truth. That, that's from a Latin word for literally enfleshing it, to put skin and bones on an idea. For, for, for Jesus, his coming into the world, he, in a mysterious and powerful and true way, Jesus incarnated God's love. He, he, puts, he put flesh and bones on himself as God. And he, he walked among us. Those, I, I appreciate uh, John 1.14 that we, we read every Christmas time that um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I appreciate it. It's, it's kind of folksy and maybe a little cheesy, but I like the way that the message actually paraphrases it. Eugene Peterson, who translated it, put it like this. Um, the word came to town and came to live in our neighborhood. J- Jesus came really close to us physically. He and he, he lived in the, in the cultures and the times and the brokenness and the troubles, and he lived among the sins of real people with real problems. He incarnated God and gave real life, flesh and blood examples of his own message. And when our lives are transformed and when they're changed, that testifies, that, that gives formal courtroom testimony to God's power to change our hearts through his grace and God will transform people not just through what we say, but through the way we display his love to them. I, I think this is probably all stuff y'all already know, but it's worth reminding because we keep forgetting it over and over and over again, that God works through our changed lives. And he wants us then to take what we've been given and to just be like children with our, our loving dad. We just want to toddle after our dad and if he lets us hold the flashlight, if that's the part of the job he wants us to do, I want to hold that flashlight as well as I can. I want to, I want to do what he does in my life with other people. Let's open the Bible to Colossians chapter 3 to see the, the, the Bible's call to do just that. Colossians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 15. Where Paul uses language of putting on, putting off. Sort of. What do I mean by that? Let's start in Colossians 3.15. Paul writes to this church that he only knows by reputation. He's, he didn't plant this church. He's never been to Colossae, but one of his co-workers, a man named Epaphroditus, um, has been serving him in his own ministry. He's writing this from prison, and Epaphroditus has been telling him the story of how he, he had heard the gospel and been converted to Jesus, and now he'd gone back to his hometown, Colossae. So now Paul is writing to this church that he only knows by reputation through Epaphroditus, and he tells them, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is one of the New Testament's clearest calls to what we might call and what the book talks about as personal ministry, just the way that we serve other people in Jesus' name through normal relationships. And this is one of the clearest calls to it. We have, what's the call, this call here? To, to be wise, to more than once to be thankful, um, to be prepared to teach each other and admonish, we could maybe say to comfort other people, um, that, that's the call to do that in the course of, you know, in Sunday morning gatherings, but all week long throughout the course of our regular lives. But we really shouldn't start in verse 15. Because verse 15 is coming in the middle of another thought. So let's back up, bump your eyes up a few more sentences to verse 12. How do, how do we become people who do that kind of stuff as a part of our regular lives? Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
Paul's using this really important metaphor, this clothing language, you know, put on a jacket, take off a jacket. Clothing's important because it covers us, covers us up, right? So we won't be, you know, if you're from Appalachia, so you won't be naked, N-E-K-K-I-D, naked. Um, clothing covers us but also identifies us. You know, you can tell something, a lot about a person based on how they choose to dress or how they're able to dress. Clothing uh, describes our function. So if, if, if I'm wearing a white collar and a tie every day, you wouldn't necessarily assume I'm a ditch digger. Like my, my clothes serve a purpose for me in my everyday life. Paul's reminding us that what we, what we wear in moments of personal ministry is just as important as what we say. And I'm, you know, again, we're not talking about physical clothes here, right? We're not saying, like, in order to really represent Jesus well, you better, you know, wear your Sunday best. Sundresses and pearls and ties. And Paul's not talking about that. He's talking, you know, about Christ-like character. And essentially, Paul's really saying here, if you're going to be involved in what I want to do and what I am doing in the lives of the people around you, you've you got to come dressed for work. Come, come dressed for the job. And what kind of clothing does Jesus want us to wear to work? Well, it's not just individual, isolated items of character. The qualities here really add up to the, the character of Christ. It's, sometimes it's overly simple to say it, but Jesus says, I want you to dress like I do so you will be and do who I am and what I do. God's, God changes people, not simply because we said the right thing, even if it was hard, to people because those strong words sometimes he changes people because those strong words are said with compassion and with kindness and humility with gentleness with patience with love with self-control are you, are you, are you remembering where's another place these things are strung together we, we we have the fruit of the spirit and no one was filled with the spirit like jesus was we, we in our normal relationships we, we stay us we don't magically become transformed into some sort of Zen, Buddhist, guru type person who's totally different than who we used to be. We, we are ourselves in the personalities that God has created us to have, but in becoming more like Jesus, we don't become ourselves less. We become the real version of ourselves that God has called us to be, and we do that by enfleshing or incarnating Jesus in our lives. Because when we do this, we become that physical evidence of the very things we are trying to present to other people. And when that happens, we're not just representing truth as some, this is the way the world works and you better shape up or ship out. We are representing truth, but because we're really representing Christ, who's with us and who's really our only hope. And that, that incarnational aspect of, of ministry, which remember, I'm going to keep saying ministry slash service, exact same word. We translate the word ministry just because it's traditional, but really it just means service. It's the normal Greek word for service. The incarnational slant to our service as Christians is important because God uses who we are to convey the truth as well as what we say. But our relationship with other people is important for other reasons as well. Our relationships matter because in personal ministry, as I was talking about earlier with someone, the sin and the brokenness and the sadness of other people that we're serving will be revealed in the course of our relationship but not just in a knowledge sense of, oh, I'm going to understand the, this person's story better and I'm going to learn facts about them. No, that their sin and their brokenness is going to be incarnated in the way that they treat you. So if you're serving someone who's angry, if you have a relationship with somebody who fights anger, at some point they're going to get angry at you. If you are in a relationship with somebody who really struggles to trust other people, at some point they're going to distrust you. A depressed person is going to tell you that they tried everything you told them and they took all your advice into consideration and it just didn't work. And you and I are going to have to think about it this way. You, we can't stand next to a puddle without eventually getting splashed by the puddle. It, it's, it's just the way that the relationships in our lives work. It's the way that the relationships worked in Jesus' life. Um, to put it really overly simple, simply, Jesus got splashed by the muddy streets that he came to live on. When he moved into the neighborhood, he moved into the apartment in front of the pothole. And every time he went outside, he got splashed too, just like we do. 
But that wasn't an accident. That wasn't a, oh man, I wish I'd checked Zillow better before I bought this place. This was a, I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Even if it costs me my life. I'm willing to be, I don't, Jesus was not some weird sadomasochist who was seeking pain, but he, with eyes wide open, went into this ministry he chose to glorify the Father, to glorify his own name, to, to spread life and love to as many people in the world as would accept him. Jesus came into the world knowing, I'm going to get really dirty in the course of getting this job done. And so we've got to be the same way, and we've got to be wise about it. You, you remember Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We, we need to watch our reactions to the people we're serving. Because, I don't know about you, I can only get splashed so many times before I start to get really angry about being wet and muddy. And I start to question whether I should be standing here in the first place. What, what kind of fool am I? If I of course I'm going to get splashed if I stand here. I just need to go stand somewhere else. Which, yeah, I'm not going to be in this person's life to really help them, but I'm not going to get splashed anymore. Or maybe I will stay there. I'm not going anywhere, but you're going to know that I don't like it very much. <laughs> that I don't appreciate being treated like this. And that's going to come out in my words and my attitude and my actions. We, we are being shaped as we help other people. We're, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. As we get splashed on, we learn, like Jesus, how to get splashed on, which is going to be our next point. What are some things we go into that with, with our eyes wide open, knowing exactly what we're getting ourselves into when we deal with messy, sinful, broken people? Because remember, the Lord does work through professionals and people who do this all the time, but he really works through normal people like us who just happen to know you. I just happen to be in your family. I just happen to be your friend. I just happen to work with you. He uses us in this big web, this big network of changing people because we're his ambassadors. I, I love this, what, this line from the book. Dr. Tripp says, personal ministry to suffering sinners will always mean sacrifice and suffering for us. If it had been any other way, then Jesus would have done that. You, you remember even in the hour of his arrest, Jesus asked the Father humbly but boldly, if there's any other way, to accomplish this mission. Like, let the cup pass from me. I don't desire suffering for its own sake. But if suffering is part of it, even suffering to the point of experiencing God's wrath and, his, and hell on earth on the cross, then your will be done, not ours. Jesus is just like us, who says, if there's a way for me to get out of it this way, if there's another way, then please, Father, let it happen. And the Father, truthfully, and, and we can only imagine the mystery of what this was like for God um, for the Father to show His Son in as many words, there's just no other way, Son. There's no other way for us, then, to help people. We, we, in serving other people, will always have to sacrifice and suffer. And sometimes it may not even feel like it. Sometimes, you know, you, you, someone can compliment you and say, well, you can say, well, you know, it wasn't really that big of a deal to me. It wasn't that hard for me. M maybe it actually is a small sacrifice for you. But maybe the Lord's just built you and prepared you so that you know, what's actually a substantial sacrifice? Just tr it actually is a substantial sacrifice. It just didn't feel like that for you. But sometimes we are all going to be called to, to toe the line and to say, um, whatever the cost, I, I, I want to be able to help. I want to be able to help. I want to be able to pay the cost, even if it hurts me, if it hurts other people that I love. I'm willing to sacrifice. And that's where we see if we're going to be like Jesus and, and represent him as ambassadors to the world, we, we've got to incarnate him. We've got to do it the way he did it. But that means, I mean, there's no other way to go, there's no other place to go next. That means we have to identify with suffering. And that's not just accepting, okay, I know I'm going to suffer. I'm going to have to do a harder thing, a risky thing, a kind of a vulnerable thing. I'm going to choose to identify with other people's suffering. I'm not going to, when the people around me, when they sin and they fight the, the consequences of sin, or when they have been seriously hurt in their past, and I know that if I get to know them too well, if I get too close to them, um, probably the same thing's going to happen to me. I'm going to get some scars in the process. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we do know we can't, we can't serve people like Jesus served people at arm's reach. We've got to get real close, close to that puddle where we know we really might get splashed here. Um, take a quick 
break for, for, to ask yourself this question. Have you ever gone through just a real hard time and you felt totally alone while you were going through it? Maybe intentionally, people were intentionally being cruel to you or maybe people just didn't realize that you felt like that, but I think the answer is yes for all of us. Right? We can all probably name some examples, but have you ever in the middle of that suffering wondered if you were the only one who had ever gone through something like that? Have you ever thought in the middle of a difficulty that the people around you just didn't care? Have you ever thought while well, you're going through something like that, does God even care? Because I didn't really feel like it right now. One of the predictable, predictable but tragic realities of our life in this world is suffering. It's just woven into the world. The, the virus of sin has come in and infected everything. And even after it's gone, or at least it's not obviously raging in our system, it leaves behind these scars. The, the world has just gotten brokenness and sadness and pain and suffering built into it at this point. It's just everywhere around us, everywhere. Um, it, it's, it's touched all of our lives. It, suffering is both a tool of redemption. The Lord uses it in our lives. He, he takes bad things and he, does, he brings good out of them. But it is, it is an occasion. Suffering, when we suffer, it is an occasion for us to enter into great temptation. So yes, the Lord is working through those moments where you suffered and, and went through very difficult things. And maybe even in this moment are going through very difficult things. The Lord is at work. He, you're not alone. He's using those things. But it is, a, it is a spiritual test. It is a pop quiz. Not, not that the Lord is some cruel teacher who's wagging his finger at you to see if you get the right answer, but it is an opportunity for us to reveal what's going on on the inside. In the middle of our suffering, are we going to give in to temptations of any various kind? Or are we going to continue in the path of Jesus? Suffering is just the common ground. In, in any relationship you have with anyone who's difficult, um, anyone who's broken by sin and, and sinning against others, even if it's a sin that you can honest to goodness say, man, I have never been tempted with that particular sin. Or your life story is so radically different from mine. I, I, how do I identify with the story of this woman, Grace, when it, 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 it's just very different from my life story? I can't say, I know exactly what you're going through. I, I can't, we just can't say that. That's, what do we do in those moments? Well, we start with this. No matter who I am and no matter who I'm helping, We've got suffering in common. Both of us have gone through hard things, probably some things that were consequences for our own stupidity, but some things just were plain not our fault. We didn't choose to have them happen. And I have that in common with you, brothers and sisters. I have that in common with people who aren't Christians yet. And so do you. Look, look at these short verses in Hebrews chapter 2. Because this shows us a glorious thing about who Jesus is. But I think it gives us such wisdom for how we serve the people in our lives. Just two verses here. And, and it's, it's hard to jump in anywhere in Hebrews. For y'all who were a part of the study last year, y'all know Hebrews is a... Some people actually think this is the manuscript of a sermon that was preached. It's hard to jump in and hit play in the middle of the sermon. But uh, you remember in chapter 2, the author here is talking about how great Jesus is. And because of his greatness, we have to be extremely careful not to walk away from him. Because as great as he is in salvation, he's just as great in, in the rightness of bringing judgment on those who don't trust him. But there, here's the comfort here. Jesus is able to save people who are tempted to walk away. And in, in, in verse 10, listen. It was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, the Father in this context, it, it was fitting that the Father, in, 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 in the course of bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Be for or Because he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers. Stop right there. This passage is pointing to the importance of recognize, recognizing the commonality of suffering. Look, look again, Christ is again our model here. He is our example, not just only in terms of do what he did and be like he was, as if we're not already being and doing it, but he's saying you already have something in common with Jesus, brothers and sisters. 
This passage is about how Christ, the author of our salvation, he chooses to identify with us. He made changes, humanly speaking, to his daily routine to be more like us, to be with us. And those changes, his incarnation into the world and his ministry from birth to death involved real sacrifice and and involved a real cost. It says here that Jesus, because of this, because he, he, he now, he can actually say, whenever we pour out our hearts to him and we say, Lord, this is just too hard. I don't know how much longer I can take it. Or this is just too complex. I don't know how to get through this. I don't know the right answer here. We can never say something to Jesus and him in response say in as many words, man, I hope that works out okay for you because I got nothing. I don't, that sounds really hard. I have never gone through something like that. We, we just don't have a Savior who, can, who, who says that to us. Instead, he calls us brothers. He's able to call us brothers. Just think about that title for a second. I, I, don't, I don't have any brothers um, by birth. Um, maybe you do. But think about what it means to be able to call somebody a brother. Um, it, it, you know, it means you know, we have a sibling relationship. We, we got a mama and or daddy in common. Um, a sibling, a brother is somebody who in some sense at least, in some sense, is an equal to you. We have something really important in common that puts us on level ground. Um, if I have a brother, it means you know, we're in the same family and we have a similar position in the family. We're both children of the same parents. And, and, and here's the thing that is really what the author of Hebrews is getting at is, if someone is your brother, you and he share the same life experiences in some way just because you're part of the same family, because you're brothers. That, that should be the character. That should be the, the way, the feel our relationships have with the people in our lives. Whether we say it like this or not, whether we can fully say it like this or not, we would want, and it, it would be a good thing to pray for, we want the people in our lives to be able to say, I don't think she has ever treated me like she was better than me. I don't think he has ever said anything or done anything that made me think he thinks he stands above me. We, we want to have the character of Jesus, the, the personal character of his personal ministry, which is humility. Um, Augustine, the church father, was very famously asked, what are the three most important uh, characteristics of a Christian? And he says, oh, that's easy, humility, humility, and humility. Not just because they're, they're great and we would want that, but because Jesus himself is such a perfect and flawless example of humility, of considering other people's more and their needs more significant than his own. And of having a, a right and a proper and a sober-minded assessment of our own gifts. We, we don't think we're better than we are or worse than we are. We know who we are, and we use that to help other people. That humility that Christ has flows out of him through the power of the Spirit. And we share that identity with him. We share that identity of, I, I am becoming a more humble person by the power of the Spirit. Because Jesus has made it so that he came down to me, and I still, couldn't, I still couldn't come up to him. So he came down right where I was. And then when I wouldn't come to him, he reached down and he pulled me up to where he is. And now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, you remember we read a few weeks ago from Ephesians 2, because we're united to Christ by faith. He, he in his physical human body still, now and forever, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And in a meaningful way, It's not just that physically one day he will reach down and pull us up to him, but in a meaningful and a true way, we are already, like Ephesians 2 says, we are already seated at the right hand of the Father. We're already there. The check's in the mail, and the mail guy will not lose it. We are going to be delivered into that reality one day, and that changes how we treat people today. That's the point we're getting at. When we identify with suffering, if we want to identify with Jesus' glory, we've got to get there the way he got there, which is through suffering and through loving suffering people as we suffer and as they suffer too. You know, we're, we're not people's gurus. Um, we're not, we are not what they need. Yes, Mike. Yes. Oh. Which part's in Ephesians? Yes, yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I, that's the reference I meant to make. If I didn't say where it was in the, in the Bible, I, I meant Ephesians chapter 2. So Spike, great minds thinking alike. Um, 
And that's, that's right. And, and, and what Ephesians are showing us, what all of, of Christ's life and the teachings of the apostles are showing us is really simply we, we don't fix anybody. We, we are not what people need. Even the wisest, the person who gets the content of Scripture the best, that person, we, if we are that person, cannot really bring change to people's lives. But we get to be the people that God brings it through. We just get to stand around and watch while he does really good things. And, and humanly speaking, we can say, I get to say words to people that might help them in their darkest hour and change their life. We get to say that. Humanly speaking, we got to see that. But man, have you ever said just the right thing to someone who really needed to hear it and they blew it off and didn't, it wouldn't help them at all? I have. It's called parenting. Um, but, but, but also friendships. And, and I, I, you know, we are all the wisest people in the world. It's, just, it's hard being surrounded by a bunch of dummies who never listen to us, right? I'm, I'm sure y'all know what that's like. No, um, no I mean, you know, I'm joking that when I say that, but y'all know what, what I mean here. We, we really don't save anybody. We really, humanly speaking, can't change anybody. Our wisdom and our experience, our ability to say, hey, actually, man, I actually know a little bit about what you are going through because I've kind of gone through something similar. That, that might well help people, but that by itself is just not going to bring about real helpful change, real helpful healing, real, real important repentance and forgiveness. But the one that Hebrews is talking about, the person that the New Testament just cannot take their eyes off of because he has changed everything. Jesus can help people. Jesus does help and change people, and he does it not only through his word, but like we said in week one, through our relationships. And what do we have in common with this, this one who changes? What do we have in common with this wonderful, amazing counselor? We have suffering in common. That's what Hebrews is showing us. Hebrews is explaining how Christ shares this identity with us. He, he has chosen to make this connection with our lives through that touch point. It's not primarily we believe the same things about God and the world, although we ought to believe what Jesus believes about God and the world. We identify with Christ most deeply because he has suffered just like we have and even more. As the writer is saying here, that the, the, the Father who has brought about all these things, who has planned and orchestrated the universe to, so that on the grand stage of all of life, Jesus is the star of the show. That's how he's written the script. But he's written the script that not only would Jesus be the star of the show, but he's going to get a whole lot of people on stage with him. He's going to bring a lot of sons to glory. But in order for that to happen, what does Hebrews say here? Not only that it happened, but it was fitting that it happened in this way, that in making all that happen, the Father made Jesus perfect through suffering. We camped out on this a little bit last year in Hebrews, or the beginning of this year in Hebrews, but let's, let's, let's chart this out a little bit. What, what does that mean for the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, the one who helps us? What does it mean for him to be made perfect? I thought he was already perfect. I thought he already got it. Well, let's, uh, this is, I'm glad that we have a brand new whiteboard to... Uh, to display this incredibly complex little drawing I'm going to draw for you right now. You ready for this? It might take a minute to write it down. That's an arrow, in case you missed it. Let's, let's think for a second about Jesus' life. If we want to draw it out just very, 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 very simply. Christ, in everything that he and the Father and the Spirit chose to bring into the world, and, and bringing us into glory. How, how, did he, how did he do that? How did he accomplish his mission? Well, he accomplished the mission of standing in our place for us and passing every test that we failed, being perfectly sovereign over all things, nothing was apart from him, and in his life, and even in the way that he died, the Bible shows us, and in the way that he was raised from the dead and returned to heaven, Jesus demonstrated righteousness. It's one thing, and this is a thing we ought to believe, it's one thing to believe that Jesus is righteous because the Bible says so. It's true, we should do that. But Jesus backed up his message with, about himself. He backed up all the prophecies, he, he backed up all the promises in his own life, in the way that he treated other people, in the way that he lived his life before his Father. Jesus demonstrated righteousness on earth, but he did it, as he was suffering. That's what Hebrews is at, at pains to talk about, is that not only did Jesus do the right thing all the time, but he did it under the hardest and harshest circumstances. 
I can be really nice when I'm not hungry. I can be really nice when I'm not angry, when I don't feel lonely. I can be really nice when I got a good night's sleep. But when I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, everything in life just gets harder. Um, when I'm perfectly satisfied in all those categories, I'm still not that great of a guy sometimes. Um, I can say with boldness, I think, because of what the Bible says. I, don't think, I think you guys, we share that in common. We're not, we're not that great. And the, the circumstances of our lives make us often even worse than that. Jesus demonstrated righteousness as he was suffering. He, he had perfect knowledge of every test that he was going to be asked to go through, but he still had to go through the test. Um, it's like the army brass knew that Captain America could run a one-minute mile, but he still had to go through the test. And he had to go through it at the same schedule as every other soldier because he was a soldier. He didn't get any passes. He had to pass every test that we are asked to pass, and he passed them with flying colors as he was suffering. And if that's the way that, Christ, that the Father brings people to himself in bringing many sons to glory he does it as we demonstrate righteousness through suffering because that's how jesus did it well guess what over here there's us we, we in our lives are being called in the same way to not yes what do we read in colossians we are already declared to be holy and beloved people if we the moment we trust in jesus we have a status we have a title that god gives to us but that does not instantly change our practical actions every day we are by god's power and kindness being sanctified we honest to goodness if we follow jesus and the longer we do it are actually becoming holy in the stuff that we say and do but in, in what we want in life and who we are we are becoming that but how are we how are we getting from here to there in the same way that jesus did except he already had a perfect starting place. He demonstrated righteousness through suffering. We are going to demonstrate righteousness by taking two steps forward, one step back most of the time. But we are going to get to this point, brothers and sisters, this is a great hope that we have in ourselves, but also think about the, the believers that we get to serve as and our ministry to other Christians. That no matter how broken our bodies are, no matter how broken our minds are, it does not matter our past or where we come from, we, brothers and sisters, we're just not going to go to hell. We're not going to go to hell because the Father has saved us in Jesus' his Son. He's going, to, he's going to get us through this. It's, it's a little more pleasant along the way if along the way we are gladly chasing holiness and becoming more like Jesus. But Jesus is really good at saving bad people. We will be saved. We will not go to hell, brothers and sisters. And so when we serve each other as Christians, we are investing in a project that God has given a guarantee this is going to pay dividends when we serve other i'm speaking specifically about christians when we serve other christians we can have a confidence that even if they don't react the way i want them to if they're not helped in the way or the timeline that i want them to be helped god is working through out through us and through their suffering to bring them to sanctification even if we're helping non-christians who the bible is perfectly clear even if we're helping non-christians who right now are still under the judgment of death and st are still standing in a place where they rightly deserve hell and all of God's wrath against their sins. Even if we're serving them, we can, we can minister to them knowing that, one, we've got suffering in common. Two, God does work through his word and through, people, through his people like us. And three, somewhere along this arrow here of the other person's suffering, wherever they are in the story, this, this poor, poor woman we read the story about earlier, Somewhere along the line of realizing our suffering, we might realize, wait a second, there's a, there is a Savior who suffered with me and for me. And he suffered in my place. And I know that not just because I hear and read the Bible, but because of the way Pam, or the way that Spike, or the way that Christian, the way that One Savior Church as a whole has served me in my suffering, in my sin. And so I'm, I'm not being converted or saved by any individual person or by one Savior by any means, but God worked through people and he showed me in his word that he can redeem my suffering. 
and that my suffering has a purpose if I've placed my faith in Christ. If I'm united to him just by trusting in him. How many, I won't ask for a show of hands. I think a lot of people become Christians as that little story plays out in our lives. Where someone comes alongside us and as many ways we see what's happening to me happened first and way worse to Jesus. And if it happened to him because he chose it for me, I don't even know what I'm signing up for, but I want in on that. I, I, I want to follow him. I want to know him forever. And whatever I know about that, I don't know what all's coming. Like, like we sing um, in, in this new song that we've learned, uh, His love can never fail. I do not ask to know the way my feet will have to tread, but only that my soul may feed upon the living bread. Tis better far that I should walk by faith close to his side. I may not know the way I go but I know my God. And you do not know, have to know a lick of theology to understand that. That this Christ, if he suffered for us and with us, and that's gonna, that led to demonstrating righteousness, that, that doesn't just mean that we and the people we serve can be saved. But in the process of being saved, I'm going to become more and, more and more like this Jesus. That not only could I become like him, but I could actually invite other people into this too and, and like despite all human odds, it might actually work. Like, they might actually, like, listen to my invitation. They might receive my help. They might be encouraged by my words and my life. Like, Jesus does not just pull us up to a position of being freed from suffering and judgment. Jesus pulls us up to the position of helping other people like he does. We get, brothers and sisters, we get to jump in on this work with him. And that means not only do we identify with suffering as painful as it is, because we know that Jesus works through suffering and he redeems suffering. It also means this, where we'll close today. We can accept other people and their problems just as they are, as awful as it often is. We can accept them with an agenda. Here's what I mean by that. We have received this amazing grace that causes Christ to accept us into his family. And that grace that brings us into the family, let's, let's just be very sober-minded about this, it does not say, it is not a grace that says you are okay just as you are. God's grace does not say, you do you, boo. Um, glad to have you on my team. Go have fun. Doing whatever you used to want to do and be. That's, that's just not the grace that God gives, as the scriptures show us really plainly. God's grace, his, his, his call to us, his acceptance of us as we go through those double doors of justification and adoption. On the other side of those doors that we go through by faith in Jesus, it is not a, a call to chill out and relax, is it? No, it, it's a call to work. Strive, Hebrews 12, strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Work for it. It's, that word strive is from the Greek word that we get agonized from. Agonize for holiness. Wrestle for it. But at the same time, we know that this is a grace that changes us. It is not a grace that only comes to changed people. People who are already getting their, their, their act together. I, 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 I do understand this because I'm a, I'm a sinner myself. I'm a sufferer. It, it never ceases to amaze me in talking to people who aren't Christians yet who've expressed some interest, you know, that's especially if they want to talk to a pastor, it's because they're, they're kind of interested, they're kind of wrestling with this, the Lord is doing something in their lives, where they're not Christians yet, and they know they're not Christians yet, um, but they honest to goodness think that they one day might become a Christian, but first they just need to get their act together. They gotta, they gotta clean themselves up a little bit. They gotta stop sleeping with their girlfriend, um, they gotta stop swearing at work, they gotta stop doing whatever it is they're doing, and then, then they'll become a Christian, because then they can become a Christian. I, in some ways, I love those conversations, because uh, I feel almost like a cheesy TV game show host. I feel like I, can, I, I get the privilege to say, like, friend, like, you can get this grace right now. You, I hate to be the buzzkill, you can't clean yourself up enough to come to Jesus. But, but, he will clean you up if you come to him. He will change you. And so, kind of like Peter tells the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, like, 
what's keeping me from being baptized, man? Like, if you trust in Jesus, you're in. Like, you can receive this today. You can get in on this right now if you take Jesus at his word that he loves sinners. We accept people as they are and say, this is a gift that God is holding out his hand to give you right now. But it is not a gift that we communicate to people will leave you the same. I've used this analogy before. It is not good news for someone who's going through addiction to find out that all the bad stuff they've done as an addict is forgiven, but they're still in the situation of being an addict. <clears throat> what an addict wants to hear is that you are forgiven, you are cleansed, you have been made free, you, the chains that have, are binding you to this addiction are broken so that you don't have to live this life anymore. That's good news to an addict. That's, that's good news to a sinner when we find out that this grace that brings us to God will not leave us ungodly. We have a total package to offer people. We can love people who are making the stupidest decisions we can imagine, who have just washed their hands of anything to do with God and his people. They have just scorned every good thing God has dropped right in their lap. We can say, you, you do need to change but you don't have to change before God starts changing you. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask God to help you accept that because I couldn't have accepted it unless he helped me. And I don't know anybody else who would either. This is the good news that we can, we, that we can do in the, in the act of loving other people. We've had to rush through a lot of stuff, haven't we? It's been a long morning. So let's quickly, quickly recap what we just talked about. Because next week... We're going to move on to something different. Next week, we're going to say, okay, well, how do I actually love people? It, sorry, if I actually love people like this, how do, I, how do I wisely and biblically talk to people? What do I say in the course of a relationship with a sinful person or a really hurting person? How do I, how do I represent or incarnate Jesus in that situation? Well, the last two weeks hopefully have shown we do it because we love them. God has ordained for us to suffer as his people so that we will be qualified agents, that we would be authorized representatives of a Jesus who suffered himself. So it's God's plan for us to suffer so that we can help people with comfort. We can compassionately do it, not as somebody who holds them at arm's length. And God's calling us to offer that same loving acceptance that he gives us while we also take God's loving agenda of change. That's how we approach people. You know, we can ask ourselves, you know, have, we, have we hoarded all this comfort and all this help that's God given, that God's given us? Have we, taken, have we taken advantage of the opportunities that God is giving us to help and to comfort the people in our lives who do not have their acts together? They may not accept it right now. They may have been stiff-arming us for years, but have we, have we seen our hearts changed by the Lord's love to us so that we, even if we don't know what to do, that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about, even if we don't know what to do, I genuinely want to help other people. Because if, if that's true, if I've accepted that call, if, I, if, if I've figured out I want in on this, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, but I want in on this, well, we, here's some stuff to walk away with thinking, we need to be looking for suffering people that God's put in our lives. And there's no one flavor or stripe of suffering. Maybe, maybe we are the suffering people who need to be helped and comforted this morning. Praise God for, for worship where so many wonderful things happen that would never happen if it were just us and our Bible and prayer. That God will help and heal us this morning. I really believe that because the Spirit's present with us. But as we are healed and comforted, like 2 Corinthians 1 say, it says, maybe, maybe the ways that I'm healed and comforted, I could pass that on to other people in ways that right now I couldn't even imagine. But I want to be prepared for those relationships. You know, what, what stories in our lives could we use as examples of, of God, how God came to us and how he changed us? He, he brought us out of some really just stupid, sinful stuff, or he brought us out of terrible suffering and, and just pain and trauma that we could never have gotten over with ourselves. And right now, this is where we'll pray. Where is God giving me the opportunity to offer grace to other people? To offer a good thing they don't deserve, but they desperately need. Where, where do we have opportunities like that in our lives?
let's, let's ask the Father to help us, because he's, he's way more invested in this actually playing out in our world than we are. He's way more invested in Effingham County. He's way more invested in your children and your grandchildren and your brothers and sisters and your friends. He's way more invested in them even than we are, because he loves us and he loves them so much more. So let's, let's call him on that promise. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we, we really do pray that in, in Christ, we're bold to pray that you would keep your word, that you would not let one of your words be wasted, that you would not let one of your people be lost, but that your people, who even right now maybe are running far away from you, who are not yet your people in the ways that they haven't trusted you yet, and they haven't repented, would you give us wisdom, please, to, to know how to serve them, how to love them well? Would you bring these people into our lives, as messy and broken and painful as it is, so that not only that they might be helped, give us humility, Lord, to love the good of other people. So Jesus, help us to suffer in the way that you did. Make us more like you in the way that we help people who are ungrateful, who are ignorant, who are wicked and evil. Make us like you in the ways that we help them. We, we need you so desperately. We, we could never do that. That, that. that all sounds really good, but um, we cannot trust your word, that that's your will and that's your plan and that's your method. We could never do that unless you came to us. So please do come. Refresh us and strengthen us. And give us courage to be bold. Forgive the ways that we've been cowardly. But give us a kind of love that would so closely mirror yours that people would not just look at us, but in the way that we treat them, they would look at us and they would see you. And seeing you would change them for the good forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.